Okay, uh, so uh, this morning what we'll be going over is a little bit about disturbance ecology. So this should be a review for you um, from what you've learned in <clears throat> uh, Dr. Kidd's ecology course. I think we even use the same definition here from Pickett and White. Um, but where this is going to be really important today, you're going to see with a lot of hardwood silviculture that your silvicultural systems are trying to mimic natural disturbances. And we certainly saw that yesterday with pine, particularly longleaf, um, where they're using both fires disturbances and then they're doing some, they're opening up some gaps in group selection systems to mimic wind throw. Um, but we're gonna see that even more heavily today in hardwood silviculture. And when we get into old growth stand structure, you're really gonna see that disturbances are a critical feature uh, that create all the complexity and structures that you'll see in old growth forests. So keep in mind, we're trying to keep everything in context, help you build up all those contexts um, so you can organize all this diverse information we're going over this week um, and continue that into silviculture and our other silviculture uh, courses here. So today, this is really focused primarily on the ecology, not the economic or societal aspects of silviculture. And so when we look at what a definition of silviculture is, um, what we're going to see, and here's this picket and white definition, um, that a disturbance is going to be um, a specific event. Uh, so that's going to be something that, you know, you have to characterize. It is one specific event. It's not um, a series of events necessarily. That would be multiple disturbances. Um, it's going to be um, something that you can put spatial and temporal bounds on. It may cover a large area, it may cover a patchy area, but you can put some boundaries on it um, and it has something you can identify as a start point and an end point. And then you have to look at what a disturbance does um, and look at the word disrupts there. They're not using uh, destroy or anything like that where it has kind of an anthropogenic context to it. Um, they're just saying it disrupts it, which means it changes it, okay? And then it goes on to say what it's changing. And so we know it's changing some aspect of an ecosystem. Um, and then it goes on to list specific things where it's the community or population structure. So in that case, it's actually gonna be impacting the organisms. We'll see a good example of that when we talk about hurricanes today, um, where the, the structure of the trees, you'll see trees being damaged. So that's our population structure. If you break the top out of a large pine um, and it hasn't been coning that year, you know, it, it's no longer going to be able to reproduce. So that's going to change the community or the population. We'll see with many of these, they change resources. Um, so think about a landslide as an example. That changes the substrate here. Substrate availability, the, the very soil itself, that also changes resources. But think about a hurricane. That changes resources too, right? Um, if you remove part of the canopy in a forest, then you're not going to have um, those um, trees blocking the understory. You get more light there. So you've got resource change in terms of light. Uh, those down needles start rotting, releasing nutrients. The root system may start rotting, releasing nutrients. The trees no longer uptaking water. Um, and in the case of a hurricane, you may dump a foot, three feet of rain. Um, so you've done a lot to change resources, or it may even impact the physical environment. Um, so we look at real extreme disturbances like volcanism. Uh, so with a volcano, that may create new land even. So it's going to be a complete change to the physical environment. And so you can see it's kind of a nuanced definition, but it really encompasses all disturbances and what they actually do uh, without necessarily putting that anthropogenic lens on it where most people wanna say, what's a disturbance? Well, it's destructive um, and use sort of biased words like that. And so I just gave you a bunch of examples in explaining that definition and here's uh, those and more listed. So you've got pretty extreme disturbances like meteor strikes on here. Um, you may have pretty small disturbances like herbivory. Um, so if you have you know, one deer chewing on one seedling that's a pretty small scale disturbance and you've got everything in between. <clears throat> and so if you look at the silviculture website, uh, textbook chapter online 2.2, gets into all this in a lot more detail. 
but we need to start thinking about the different attributes of disturbance because what we want to understand is how have they impacted an ecosystem and once we know how they've impacted an ecosystem we can start predicting based on our understanding of stain dynamics how that ecosystem will respond and once we understand those two things we can start figuring out um, how to mimic those disturbances and when we mimic those disturbances that's really what we're doing in silviculture uh, none of our silvicultural treatments are exactly like a natural disturbance, but they all bear a lot of similarities um, in how our forest will respond to them. So I already talked about distribution, and we'll see that today in an example we'll work through, where you may have a disturbance that's very clustered or clumped. Um, so say they build a road and they raise the water table on one side of the road, lower it on the other side of the road. Very commonly, you'll see a lot of mortality in a forest. Um, on either side of the road potentially, and that mortality tends to be clustered. You get all these trees in an area dying. Um, or it may be very patchy. If you look at any wind disturbance, even a tornado, certainly a hurricane, um, it's always very patchy. Fire often tends to be patchy where it's impacting different areas to a different extent. Um, when we look at frequency, that's gonna be how many events happen per time in a specific area. Um, so four events a decade would be one way you could express a frequency. Um, often we're more comfortable reflecting the return interval. So when you all are discussing fire in your prescriptions for RCW habitat, um, what you end up seeing is you're saying burn every three years, burn every two years. And you can see that's one burn per, per two years or three years. So you're actually expressing the return in interval of the disturbance there. And you can see the, dis the return interval is just the inverse of the frequency. So these are basically the same thing. It's just in the wording, how you express it. The rotation period is a useful concept. And we use this, especially when we get to selection silvicultural systems, where we come back in and harvest small parts of a stand over and over and over again. Uh, like group selection, for example. But what the rotation period is, is how long it would take that disturbance to disturb the entire area. So a good way to think about this is wind disturbance up in the Northeast. Every decade, wind disturbance takes out about 10% of their hardwood forest canopy. And so that's pretty straightforward math. If it takes out a 10th of it every 10 years, the rotation period will be 100 years to disturb the entire area. Disturbances are stochastic, however they are random in a number of ways we're going to get into in a moment. And we've just talked about spatial distribution, spatial pattern. And so while the rotation period is a, you know, sort of intellectual concept, there are very few disturbances that will actually function perfectly with that concept. So wind disturbance in the Northeast, although 10% of the canopy goes down every decade, what you may see is some areas are untouched for 200 or 300 years just by random chance. Maybe they're on a, a portion of the topography that happens to be a little bit more sheltered. Um, there can be a lot of different factors at play, but other areas may get disturbed every 30 years. So it's not that the whole area actually gets disturbed. It's just a theoretical concept. If this disturbance was perfectly distributed, which none of them are, what would end up happening? How long would it take to disturb that entire area? And so with the predictability, this is a bunch of statistical jargon that probably doesn't mean much to you, right? The inverse variance in the return interval. And so variance, just think of that as variability. You're dividing one over the variability. So think about this. So if you have a return interval of maybe 200 years. So again, think about the Northeastern United States. They don't get many hurricanes, but they will get one like Superstorm Sandy. They'll get a hurricane maybe every 50 years, 200 years. So how easy is it to predict what year a hurricane is going to hit the Northeast in? It's very difficult. One over 50, you have a 2% chance of predicting that. On the other hand, you all are using Behave Plus yesterday and today to predict fire behavior. And if you have these systems where you have um, <clears throat> more uh, lo lower variance in that return interval. So in Southern forests, if you have fires occurring on average three, five, two years, uh, you can see you're going to be much more likely to be able to predict different aspects of that disturbance. Area and size, you know, that's much easier to understand than predictability. And then when we look down here at intensity and severity, those are very often confused terms. And so intensity is an attribute of the disturbance itself. It's how much force that disturbance is exerting per area per time. 
but that does not tell you what that disturbance's impact is on a forest. Severity is the actual impact on structure. Uh, so Dr. Oswald, what, what units would you put on intensity for prescribed fire, wildfire? Uh, what, well, the old school was uh, BTUs per unit, you know, area per second or whatever, but now kilojoules, some kind of energy uh, for intensity per time and it, area versus line measurement, yeah. Yeah, so you can see that's that's something you could actually quantify on a disturbance but even if you had that number, you know, the bigger the number, the more force a disturbance exerts. So the more energy a fire has, the higher the wind speeds in a tornado or hurricane, there's more likelihood that you'll have a severe impact on a forest. But that's not a given because what you don't know when you know intensity, you don't know anything about the structure of the forest itself. Some forests are resistant to certain disturbances. Some forests are resilient where they may be heavily disturbed by a disturbance, but they bounce back quickly. Some forests may not be resistant or resilient, so you may get major impacts of a disturbance. Um, so that, that's what we're looking at with intensity and severity. You really, it's very common that students will describe severity as intensity, um, so keep that in mind. And then we'll see a few examples of synergism today, uh, where disturbances at, often act in concert. Um, you saw that with one of Dr. Schnacki's uh, videos yesterday, I believe, um, where they had that prescribed fire uh, that was near, I think he mentioned uh, Fort Bragg maybe, um, but they had that prescribed fire um, and what they found was the wind picked up, they didn't expect that, it burned too hot and so that stressed their trees and then what happened? Well then they had Ips and Southern Pine Beetle outbreaks. So the fire was the first disturbance but that caused a synergism with the insects that were the later disturbance. And so we'll see that pretty commonly. Believe it or not, flooding and drought can often act in concert synergistically. That doesn't make sense. You would think a drought would fix a flood and a flood would fix a drought. Um, but if you have a forest that's frequently flooded, the trees tend to root shallowly. And then if you get into a prolonged severe drought, those shallowly rooted trees aren't acclimated or adapted to that because they're used to frequent droughts. And so you may get really high mortality in those ecosystems. We saw that back in 2011. We had a lot of mortality in bottomland hardwood stands that were our most mesic and hydric sited stands, but they just, they weren't set up for a drought because of the synergism of those two disturbances. So disturbances, you know, lightning may work by itself sometimes, but often disturbances do work synergistically. We'll see several examples of that today. We do tend to see a relationship between severity and frequency where the more frequent a disturbance is, the less severe it is. And this is a really good thing for us, especially here in the US South. If you had the opposite trend, if you had the most severe disturbances occurring the most frequently, that would mean we have more category five hurricanes than category four, more category four than category three and so on. So this is good news. The really severe disturbances that do a lot of damage, a lot of disruption, they occur less frequently. And so we can look at this, you can look at that, like I just gave an example, severity of one disturbance is one way to look at it. But we can also start placing other disturbances on a gradient here, where we get meteor strikes sometimes. I'll show you an example of one that happened in Siberia at the turn of the last century but they're extremely severe. They can level forests for miles and miles and miles and miles. Fortunately, they don't happen too often. Um, you know, glaciers can wipe out, you know, all forests on half a continent. They don't happen that often. You're looking at every 20,000, 80,000 years, uh, some time scale like that. And as we keep looking, volcanoes, hurricanes, you know, fires that get into the crown of a stand, tornadoes, pine beetle outbreaks, gypsy moth, ice storms, and then you get to a situation where you saw some of those managed longleaf pine forests yesterday where they were putting prescribed fire through. I don't think they were doing it annually, but you saw an example where he had several stands where they were burning them every other year. Um, and so that disturbance comes through every other year. It's very frequent, but because it's very frequent, you don't have fuel building up in that case and it ends up being low in severity. It's not having major impacts on the structure of those stands. Single tree blowdown would be pretty low severity, but a pretty frequent occurrence. 
So here's the opposite ends of that spectrum. Uh, so this is the, the Siberian meteor strike that hit in June 1908. Um, fortunately, it hit in a pretty remote area, but it just leveled timber for miles. You can see all the trees were knocked down in the same direction. And keep in mind, these would have been live spruce and fir trees. It took the crowns clean off them. Uh, so just an incredibly severe disturbance. It's hard to imagine a disturbance much more severe than that. And then look at this other picture over here. This is uh, slash pine in Florida, and you see one tree that's blown down and tipped up. There's a tip up mound you'll be getting into more later today in the old growth video. So here it's the entire forest on the left versus just one tree on the right. So very severe versus low severity, low frequency versus high frequency. Okay. So when we start thinking about disturbances and succession or stand dynamics, we have to start thinking about what aspects of the stand are gonna lead it to have more of an impact or less of an impact. So how are the structures of the stand and the composition of the stand gonna influence severity of the disturbance? Um, so as we start thinking about this, um, so think about a disturbance like fire, right? Um, if you have a stand like this little diagram over here, you've got a thick mid-story. What if this mid-story is waxy leaf shrubs, right? That may be an ecosystem where if you've got species like Yopon here in this crown position, and then you've got trees in the overstory, this may be an ecosystem where, you know, if you had a fire go through there, it would have a high likelihood of crowning out and creating a severe impact. Whereas what you saw in those long leaf videos yesterday, what was the first step? before they put prescribed fire back into ecosystems where fire had been suppressed for a long time, well, they would go in and thin. They gave examples where they would go in and mulch. So they're removing a lot of these fuels in this position uh, that have accumulated over decades of fire suppression so that when they then go and start using prescribed fire as an intentional disturbance, the ecosystem has a different structure. The forest has a different structure and the impact of that fire is no longer severe. You don't get a whole lot of overstory mortality. And so that's an example of silviculturally how understanding severity can tell you what do you need to do. Um, I've seen examples in longleaf pine where they've suppressed fire for a long time and they had the, these cool little areas. They had gotten fire back onto most of the landscape and it looked like many of the videos you saw yesterday, but they had these little pocket wetlands and the pocket wetlands were areas that traditionally, you know, wouldn't have burned nearly as often as the rest of the area. But through fire suppression, they had become completely full of waxy lead shrubs. And so they were basically putting fire lines around them and keeping fire out because they knew if they burned, you know, they would completely take out the overstory. Um, and so what they, what they did in that scenario was the same thing you saw yesterday. They went in and they mulched them because they were small areas you can afford to mulch small areas. Mulching is expensive. They changed the structure of the ecosystem and that ended up leading to a, a change in the severity of the disturbance. They, ha they quit having to put fire lines around them, allowed the fire to roll through them um, and they, they fixed the problem there. Uh, here, here's another thing. Uh, think about ice damage. So fire may be a bottom up disturbance often. Uh, ice damage, so in the Southern Appalachians, uh, you lose about 20% of your canopy biomass every decade to ice. So ice forms, we see this a lot in Northeast Texas, Southwest Arkansas, uh, Southeast Oklahoma, that's an area prone to a lot of ice damage. But ice really isn't gonna impact your little trees very much. It's gonna impact your larger trees, especially your wider crown trees like hardwoods. And so the ice will get in there on pines even, it'll break the tops out of them. Hardwoods, it'll break branches out of them. But when you look at ice as a disturbance, it's impacting the larger trees here. So if you had a younger stand, what ice might do, it might bend them over to the ground and then the ice melts and they spring right back up and they're fine, okay? So a five-year-old Loblolly pine stand with a lot of ice on it, there may be little to no damage. The trees can bounce right back, they're resilient. Look at what ice does though. With ice damage in large trees, it rarely kills them. It'll break the top out of a big pine, it'll break big limbs off hardwoods, you know, it'll damage them, but it will not kill them. And so that, that's what you're looking for with ice as a disturbance. And again, trees can be adapted to this. Look at spruces and firs in the boreal region, Canada, Russia, Northern Europe, um, and they have narrow crowns, their branches are drooping such 
that they can shed heavy snow loads they get in that part of the world and handle the weight. So you've got to link the characteristics of the disturbance with the structure of your stand. And so some of the things you need to start knowing, what is the stand structure? Is it young? Is it old? This is a picture of the Sandy Creek stand again on the, the right here from previous field stations. That, I guess that was field station last year. But you can see 95 year old, 85 foot tall longleaf pine. You know, if you had a, a fire through here, they burn this frequently, you don't get a whole lot of mortality. Okay, longleaf is very resistant to fire and you don't have much mid story here, so it's not a big deal. Um, if this stand gets hit with high wind, Longleaf does have a deep tap root that makes it resistant to wind. Longleaf doesn't taper much, however. Generally, what you see is that the trees that are the most wind firm tend to taper the most. And so this is the type of stand where you're kind of just waiting for that one wind event to hit this. And this stand is probably going to be pretty susceptible to a severe impact if it gets hit with heavy winds, be that a tornado or hurricane, uh, whatever that disturbance might be. So. What's, what is it? Is it a young stand? Is it an old stand? Uh, is it a dense stand or is it a sparse stand? Yeah, uh, Greg, I see you have a question. Um, I was just wondering, like, um, I remember in one of the labs in insects, Dr. Colhavy talked about ice storms hitting like very, every so often and just, it swells the, the bark and snaps the tops off of like pine trees and stuff like that. Yeah, some, some parts of the country, um, if you get out there on a cold enough day, it sounds like shotguns are going off. Yeah, that, that's what he said. He sounds like, oh, somebody's shooting off skeet or something like that. But no, it's the tops of the trees snapping off. And it may not even be the tops. Um, trees will get frost cracks. You rarely see yeah. it this far south, if at all. Um, but they'll get frost cracks. And so it, it almost looks like a lightning strike on a tree where it just opens that tree from top to bottom on one side. It doesn't necessarily kill the tree, it can. Um, but in that part of the country, so if you look at our trees, if you look at this longleaf pine picture up here, it, heat is the issue. And so our trees, you'll see, uh, look at silk tree mimosa around here. I know it's an invasive species, but if you go around in the late afternoon, you'll see its leaves drooping. And they're drooping so they get less sun on them because they don't want to get too hot. So trees can overheat uh, much in the same way you or I can. Um, that's one reason they transpire a lot. One reason is that that's how trees sweat, basically, so that evaporating water will cool them. But up north, they may have to contend with great cold, and so trees develop different mechanisms for that. So think about maple syrup, right? You're getting a lot of sugar uh, in the spring sap in species like sugar maple. Well, one reason it's there, the more stuff you dissolve in water, uh, the... the um, the, basically the, the lower the freezing point gets. Uh, so it serves as a, a mechanism to sort of prevent damage there. So it's kind of like trees own antifreeze if you want to think about it that way. Uh, here, let me see if I can get this open and share it with you. Dr. Oswald just sent a picture. <laughs> I'd be kind of interested to see like how, because we get some wildly fluctuating temperatures, like it, it'll be like upwards of 80 and then dip down to like almost 40 in the night. I'd be interested to see how that affects like the tree's growth patterns. Well, anytime a tree is above 40 degrees, 40 degrees isn't cold for a tree. So anytime yeah. a tree is above 40 degrees, it is most likely photosynthesizing. Um, so it may not be much of a big deal there at all. Um, so here, maybe I'll be able to zoom in on it a little, but here, Dr. Oswald just shared this. These frost cracks are really interesting because wow. uh, what will happen is that especially during the winter months on a thin bark tree, the sun will warm up one side of it, but not the north side necessarily. And so the pressure on that stem itself is such that it has to give some place if you get that uh, crack. Uh, I used to see a lot in Michigan. Uh, it almost always occurred during the winter months. <laughs> what kind of tree is that? That's like, definitely a cherry of some sort. Yeah, it was just a cherry I grabbed. Um, yeah. One of the times we had a group over in Sweden, there was an old cemetery we went to and it was all birch trees and just about every one of them had frost crack in it. Mm. Uh, yeah. Yeah, you got to remember trees can't move. That, <laughs> that really changes the game for them. 
Unless it's that weird grass thing in the desert that the legend is it can walk. Yeah, not really. <laughs> yeah. Or is that just in that movie Rango? I think so. <laughs> well, thanks for okay. thanks for answering my question, Dr. Stovall. Yeah, and Lord of the Rings. Oh yeah, I forgot about Hence. Oh, yeah, Tree Beard. <laughs> Yeah, so, yeah, extreme cold's a problem, but we don't think about that a lot around here because it's rarely a problem around here. Um, I can't think of any frost cracks I've seen this far south. Uh, usually when you see something like that this far south, it's lightning. Um, so then you got to think about the silvics of the species. And you saw this on one of our quiz questions, right? Uh, so which of the southern pines have serotonous cones that are native to East Texas? None of them, right? Uh, but you do have species elsewhere like Table Mountain Pine in the Southern Appalachians where they're really well suited to fire in the sense that their silvics are set up. When a fire comes through, that's when their seed hits the seed bank. So that's what a serotonous cone does for you. But we've seen other adaptations to fire that you saw yesterday where longleaf in that grass stage, the needles burn and release heat through steam to protect that large bud. The bud is white and reflective, so it reflects heat. It's got all that filament on it that can smolder a little bit and still protect that bud, keep that bud alive. As long as that apical meristem is alive, the tree's probably okay. And then shortleaf has a completely different strategy. Shortleaf just says, that's fine, you can top kill me. I don't care. Um, so longleaf is resistant to fire when it's a seedling where it just stands there and takes it, shortleaf is resilient. It says, fine, top, kill me. I don't care. I'm going to re-sprout from the basal crook. And so it, it is severely impacted. It basically looks dead, but then boom, it sprouts right back. And so completely different adaptations. One went the path of resistance, one went the path of resilience, but they both work. They both give new trees to stock that stand following disturbance. So what are the silvics to the species in your stand? Um, and you know, how do they behave with fire? And I'm sure you guys have seen the fire effect information system. Um, using that along with Silvix of North America, it's got a lot of great information in there on all our tree species for fire, but it's got a lot of just great Silvix in there, other stuff unrelated to fire. Uh, so that's a really good source to use. If I don't find information I'm looking for in Silvix of North America, I often go to the fire effect information system next and look there. Um, and you see a lot there. Crown morphology, especially with disturbances like ice, uh, wind, crown morphology can be a pretty key factor, snow loading. So how's that gonna impact it? Um, you know, if you look at this longleaf pine picture, it's a very intolerant species of shade. Well, species that are very intolerant of shade tend to self prune their branches. They kill off their lower branches pretty quickly because they can't handle that shaded environment. But what does that do in the instance of fire dis as a disturbance? In the case of longleaf, because they're also great self pruners, they not only kill off the branches, but they drop the branches, you end up without much fuel in between the top and the bottom of this tree, okay? Whereas look at other species like Virginia pine that grow on xeric ridges in the Appalachians. Uh, they're a common Christmas tree here in East Texas. They're shade intolerant. They kill off their lower branches but they're really bad at self pruning. They have all these limbs hanging on dead. They look ghostly gray and white because they bleach, they lose all their bark. But if this stand looked like that and you, you know you did a prescribed burn, you might see some different impacts on your, your overstory cohort there. So um, what are the silvics of the, the tree that, that can make a big difference in how it responds to the disturbance? With wind, how tapered is it? I mentioned that. What's its rooting habit? Um, eastern white pine, you see that tip up all the time in the northeast. It tends to be a more shallowly rooted species. So there you go. And that, that dictates wind firmness. How does it reproduce? Okay. Uh, if you put a, a severe uh, disturbance, a disturbance that has high intensity and that leads to a severe impact, if you put that through a trembling aspen stand, you probably still have a trembling aspen stand. Okay. It resprouts, no big deal. Uh, because it's a prolific root sprouter, you can have those large clonal stands out west. However, if you look at synergistic disturbances, so you put a disturbance through a trembling aspen stand that kills it off, and then you also have a really high density of elk, well, you may not have a trembling aspen stand because the first disturbance kills the big trees, and the second disturbance, herbivory by elk, may prevent any of those sprouts from actually making it into the overstory. Um, when they put up high fence to keep elk out of aspen out in like Arizona, they leave the high fence up until the trees are like 25 feet tall. 
because they're fighting elk and elk can just jump up on a tree. You know, they're hitting it 10 feet in the air probably when they jump up on it, drop it to the ground and munch on the leaves. So it's not even that they're just, you know, stooping down and hitting little seedlings. They'll take down pretty substantial saplings uh, in order to, to munch on the leaves there. So, um, so again, synergism comes into play with the Silvix. It's all linked together. We're going to see a lot about gap formation in old growth forests this afternoon. So just keep in mind gaps are variable. We live in the northern hemisphere, which means the sun is generally over here to our south if south is left and north is right, which means most, most times of day the north side of a gap is getting more light, the south side is getting less. And so you'll get variability in the shade tolerance of species that are well suited to different microsites within a gap. Then look at the roots extending out from the trees and you end up with areas in the middle of a gap with less below ground competition areas at the edge with more. And so gaps end up being very spatially heterogeneous where you have the most light in the north, the, the most shade in the south side of a gap if it was round like this, you know, with little root competition in the middle, a lot on the outside. And what comes back when you overlay all those different environments, you know, it's going to be variable even in a small gap. Then you look at how the trees get there. So this is distance from the forest wall. We can use this scale up here in feet. That's more comfortable for most of, most of us. 100 feet from the, the edge of the, the forest wall, 200 feet, 300 feet. Look at these different species, Engelmann spruce, white and uh, Shasta red firs. Look at longleaf pine and sweet gum here. Sweet gum has tiny seeds. Longleaf has huge seeds. So this might be counterintuitive, but longleaf can distribute a lot further than sweet gum. Well, if you've ever been under a sweet gum when it's dropping seed, it feels like it's raining and then you realize you're getting hit with sweet gum seeds. They don't have a wing at all, okay? So they just fall straight down. Longleaf is a much larger seed, much heavier, but it's got the bract on it, which will help it disperse in wind. So you have different silvics with the, the seed mechanisms there, but then you can look at how you might use this information silviculturally. So yesterday you heard about shelter woods and seed trees to regenerate pines. Well, do you want to space your longleaf pines every 200 feet? Probably not. You're not going to get much seed 200 feet away from them if you put them on a 200 foot grid. The other downside to putting them on a 200 foot grid is you'd be leaving about one per acre. Um, good luck getting a logger to come back in later to remove one tree per acre. Um, but if you space them every 100 feet, that's still, you know, that's only like four trees per acre, but you're getting, look at that, you're getting like four times as much seed. But if you spaced them every 50 feet, now you're getting a lot of seed. You're also getting a lot of shades. So that's the trade-off there. Um, so you can see, you know, you may have a harder time doing a seed tree for a species like sweet gum because you don't have enough trees out there to disperse enough seed. If you need this much seed per acre, you know, if you've got those trees spaced every 50 feet, that means 50 by 50, each tree is only taking up 2,500 2, square feet. And so if it's taking up 2,500 square feet, that means you can fit about 16 of them per acre. You've left 16 trees per acre. You're starting to get in the range where we would call it more of a shelter wood probably than a seed tree. So, so seed dispersal is key and knowing how your species disperses seed is key. Uh, they didn't put uh, Western larch on here, but I'm guessing Western larch is probably way up high. Um, it, it disperses its seed pretty far. Here's a big gap. So look at this. This is obviously a clear cut, anthropogenic in nature, and you can see it's been replanted. Uh, but even with replanted stands, you're going to hear this a lot on Thursday. We worry about pine as a weed in loblolly pine plantations, which kind of doesn't make sense, right? You're trying to grow loblolly pine. Why is loblolly pine a problem? Well, if this was a loblolly pine stand on the edge, all these areas are going to get tons of seed on them these areas further away are going to get less seed. You're going to get a whole bunch of volunteer seedlings from over here. And this area right by the forest wall, you planted 600 trees per acre. You might have 2000 trees per acre when they seed in like this. And density has a major impact on how disturbances play out. So uh, back when that severe 2011 drought hit, uh, Mr. Grogan on our ST properties, uh, two stands very close in area, both planted at 600 trees per acre. One of them was still at about 600 trees per acre, a little bit of density dependent mortality it occurred. Um, 2011 drought goes through, it's fine. Another stand he had, they had planted it at 600 trees per acre, they'd got a bunch of volunteer seed in and it was clearly at a much higher density. 
that entire stand was killed by that 2011 drought. Uh, look at other density dependent disturbances. What's the number one thing we can do to prevent southern pine beetle from becoming a big problem in our forests, both locally and regionally? Thin them. Keep them in a low enough basal area that they're not overstocked. Each tree has high enough vigor that it can produce, it gets enough light, it gets enough water, it gets enough nutrients, it can produce defensive compounds that'll help ward off the beetle, and that stand just isn't an attractive target for southern pine beetle. So, you know, this gap formation and natural seeding in from adjacent stands will drive your density, and your density will drive how your stand responds to disturbances. So the disturbance creates the structure, which influences how future disturbances impact the stand. So it's all kind of cyclical in some ways. When you look at a, a large opening like this though, most of this opening is going to be fully exposed microclimate. It's not going to have much edge influence. Uh, this looks to be several hundred acres in size. Compare that to these little openings. Okay, uh, so you've got little openings here, little openings here, patch clear cuts or patch selection. Um, and what you see there is lots of edge effect. Um, variable edges like this may be good aesthetically. They create more edge per area. It may be a good thing for what you're trying to do. It may not. Here you can see they've left a tree kind of in the middle, not in the middle, but they've left a tree within the gap area. And so that's going to influence. You can see the shade under it right there. So these are all considerations you need to make um, with shade tolerance, with gaps, with all that ecology. So if we look at a stand here, normally we would do this as sort of a, a class exercise, but hypothesize what might happen to this stand over the coming years in the event of a severe fire, a severe windstorm, a severe ice storm. So this is leading you to the idea of top-down versus bottom-up disturbances. Uh, so if you had a severe windstorm wind storm impact this stand, species A here in the overstory may be very impacted and it may actually release B. So that may be good for whatever species is here in this understory and midstory position and release it. So that severe windstorm is gonna be a top-down disturbance. Um, if you look at the severe ice storm, same thing. It may break canopy out of A, may not have much impact on B, may release them a little, not as much. Top-down disturbance. Look at a fire. Uh, depending on the fire that goes through, it may have a lot of impacts on B and not A. It could crown out and have impacts on both, but you're thinking of fire as a bottom-up disturbance. And with the shade tolerance, you know, if B is shade tolerant, it can be released. If B is shade intolerant, you don't get many disturbances, it may die, it may need that disturbance, so. Okay, any questions on disturbances? That's a little bit, about 40 minutes of background on natural disturbances. Any questions? Okay, uh, what I wanna flip us to for the rest of class here um, is a group exercise where we can see how we would link disturbances with um, silviculture specifically. And so I'm going to use Hurricane Hugo uh, from the 1980s in South Carolina, in North Carolina. Uh, but really, the lessons from this are identical to many hurricanes uh, that will hit Louisiana, Texas, uh, on the Arc Gulf Coast near us. Uh, so this hurricane hit on September 21st, 1989. It was Category 4 when it hit, and the eye basically hit the city of Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, you had 138-mile winds and it impacted 150 miles of coastline. Uh, you didn't get much rain from this. It was more of a wind event, but you still got 10 inches of rain. That's still a lot of rain. Uh, storm surge was between five and 20 feet, depending on where it hurt. Uh, 82 people lost their lives in this hurricane. Um, and here's a map of South Carolina where you can see moderate to heavy damage in dark and then light damage in sort of the speckled area. Charleston, South Carolina is kind of right here in the middle. And here's the path of the hurricane. And so you can see it did a lot of damage, less damage as it went further inland, less damage away from the direct path of it, but that damage was really, really patchy in nature. So it went in over 200 miles and they estimate it damaged over 11 million acres. So to put that in context, East Texas is 23.5 million acres, give or take, and we have 12 million acres of forest land. And so with our 12 million acres of forest land, you know, imagine a disturbance impacting basically all of it, and that's what you have happening here with Hurricane Hugo. They estimate that it damaged or destroyed 21.4 billion board feet of timber. 
So just a massive impact on the forests of the region. Now, when we think hurricane, we think of that as a single wind event, but it's not. Uh, the hurricane spawned vortices, which are essentially tornadoes. So this was a disturbance that led to the spawning of some 3,000 tornadoes basically within the hurricane. Um, and you can see here where it broke the tops out of a lot of these hardwoods. Over here, it did nothing. So this is some of the impacts where it would be localized here, not over there. So very patchy in nature. Some of you after yesterday may be very sick and tired of hearing about red cockaded woodpeckers. So I put this in there for you. Uh, it killed two thirds of them in the Francis Marion National Forest. So if a dumb bird uh, goes up and first decides to drill into a live pine, there's a reason every other woodpecker is drilling into dead pines. Uh, it's a lot easier to do, but it decides to drill a big old cavity into a live pine. And then you put a lot of wind on that live pine and you put a lot of stress on it. Where does the live pine break? Well, it turns out almost each and every time it breaks right at the cavity. And so all the RCW cavity trees snap basically right at the cavity. Um, so it killed two thirds of them, about a third of them still lived. Uh, this was a, this is a pretty large national forest with a pretty significant population of RCWs, but you can see the damage where it didn't uproot these longleaf pines. Again, deep taproot, right? But it snapped them. You can see some smaller of, of them being bent over. And when we look at this, it hit bottomland hardwood areas too. So you got some snaps there. Look at this big tip up mount. So a more shallowly rooted species may be more prone to tipping up like this. Look at the standing water in here, okay? So these bottomland hardwood areas are gonna have a lot of water in them. That's where a lot of the 10 inches of rain will ultimately accumulate. It destroyed a lot of trees. So this snap tree, obviously, you know, this can't be good for anything but pulpwood. But look at the standing trees in the background. You could get some saw timber out of that standing tree in the background, right? Well, what you don't realize is the wind still probably bent that tree at such an angle that it separated the annual growth rings. So if you went and put that on a sawmill and milled a board out of that, the board would not be structurally sound. It'd be prone to fall apart on those uh, growth rings, which means you can't use it for anything structural. So even the standing trees that are saw timber in size are no longer saw timber after a disturbance like this in these areas. And it just, you know, took out whole stands. So you can see lots of damage. There are a few surviving trees, but not much. So here's what we're gonna do now. What we're gonna do now, uh, you're gonna be a silviculturist working for a large forest products company in South Carolina. So imagine you're working for a company like Weyerhaeuser, Hancock, forest resource consultants, any of these big companies. Your company owns a million acres of forest land in that South Carolina coastal plain. And let's say your land is about half pine. You've got some Lamoille pine plantations. You've got some natural longleaf stands. And it's about half hardwood, split of upland and bottomland hardwoods. Okay. Um, and so your task, and I'm going to put you in groups of five for this. Your task, you wake up September 22nd, you know, on 1989. This has happened. You work for this company. What the heck do you do? Okay. So you're in charge of a million acres of timberland. You know it's been hit by this hurricane. This hurricane is no surprise. You've seen it coming for days. What do you do now? So where do you start? What do you do? And what I want is your top three priorities and then how you might go about executing each and then what your big challenges are going to be. What are your limiting factors going to be for doing your job and doing your job well um, in this time? Um, and so with this, what I'm going to do, I'll split you into groups of five. We'll see if we can use the breakout rooms. Um, so let me, I may be able to leave this up here. Uh, let's see here. Let's see how this works. Okay. So automatically in 12 rooms, five to six participants per room. So I'm going to click create rooms. You're going to disappear into these rooms. Um, I don't know if you'll still be able to see my screen share once you move into a room. I don't think you're going to be able to. Um, and so go ahead and take a screenshot of that. I'll leave it up for another minute here. So grab your phone and screenshot it or use, you know, the snipping tool or something like that. Hit print screen, something, get a picture of this. So you know what you're doing in the group rooms. Um, and in your group, talk it over. And then, uh, what we'll do is I'll see if I can pop everyone out of the, the breakout rooms at the same time. Um, and once we've done that, make sure you nominate someone in your group. Um, to give the presentation for your group. 
you'll, you'll sort of present what you did. Um, I may even see if I can enable the whiteboard where we can all write on it. So you guys, if you kind of type up what you're thinking, we may be able to enable the whiteboard so you can put some text up on the whiteboard so we can all sort of see what the different groups did, just like we write on the chalkboard um, in a classroom. We'll try that. I don't know if it'll work, but we'll see. So we may have to do it just with a verbal report. Um, there are a few people that have emailed us and they may be having issues with their microphone working. So if you're in a group with someone and they're not saying anything, uh, they may just not be able to say anything. So uh, be aware that may be an issue for some folks. So any questions before I put everyone in the, the breakout rooms on this assignment? Dr. Stovall, what was the, the date of the, the disturbance again? What, what month? September 21st, 1989. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, so I'm going to put you in the breakout rooms now. And open all rooms. Okay, it looks like you have to join the breakout room. So go ahead and click join on the breakout room. And then Oswald, you and I probably got a sign so we can just hang out. Yep, it, it asked me to join. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Let me get the recording resumed here. And... Okay, so I popped into all the groups. Sounded like you guys all had some good ideas. So I should have shared the whiteboard for you now. And let's see how this works. Um, but uh, if you could get somebody from your group uh, to add text, uh, basically with your plan on it, uh, you guys, you can use the text tool and the annotation there, hopefully. Um, and try and you know we're gonna have to space it out so each group will use a little part of this hopefully uh, but let, let's see how this works so get somebody from your group their hand is drawing yeah so i've set it up so we can see who does what so very insightful hannah uh-huh <laughs> <laughs> but yeah if, if you go to annotation tools there should be a text tool hopefully you can click that and just paste text in there that you guys have saved uh, do I need to let you know like who's in our group? Or do no, don't worry about that. Let's just you know, let's just put up the put up the information. Where's the annotation to what? I don't see that on. Well, the I'm, I'm looking at it from the host option. Let's ask Hannah. She found it. Well, like if you, I'm on my phone, so I clicked on the little blue pin. Stacy found can, it. All I can do is write with my finger. Like I can't type. Okay. Kelly's drawing a dog. Okay, maybe there's no text option here. Okay. There's a text option. I'm I'm writing something right okay. now. Okay. Yeah, Dylan found it. I'm I'm in the middle of typing something right now. Okay. So some of you are finding the text yeah, option. Dylan found it. Greg found it. Are y'all like on Landon. the phone or are y'all oh, on uh, oh, yeah. computer? What? I can't find anything on my laptop of how to operate this at all. Is there, is it like on the top? Like, should it be like on the top? Like, on it's on the top. You go to view options and click annotate. Yeah. Whoa. Oh. This is confusing. Okay. Reed wants help. <laughs> I'm hoping that's just a Zoom, but that's not more of an existential statement. <laughs> Reed, as always, we're just college professors. If you need to call 911, that may be appropriate. Oh, there we go. Got a bunch. Okay. Um, move over. Hey, you delete something. It won't let me go back to it. There's an eraser tool. Oh, okay. So if you need to type more in the same text box, click the select arrow thing. It looks like the compass rows of arrows. So click select, then click your text box, and then it will let you write within it. It is not intuitive. <laughs> like Sally has some pretty terrible nightmares. Not sure what that is. Wait, is Sally typing? 
Drew <laughs> some sort of, uh, I don't know, weird dinosaur. Is that a tremor maybe from one of the third movies? <laughs> okay, well, we've got a few answers up. Um, there, now we got a bunch of stuff up. It keeps taking me away. Can't type again. <laughs> yeah, it keeps taking me out of my text box. Oh, yeah, if you click again. anything else, it's not a convenient text box tool. Okay. Uh, let me, let me type else. Okay, well, let me see if I can do this. That, I think we've got enough. We can sort of get a gist of what you all are, are thinking about to use uh, for discussion. <laughs> So if, if you just got kicked out of annotating, I just clicked disabled. So that's not on you. Um, so as we start looking at this, let me click my spotlight tool so you all can see this. Um, and so you can see a number of group want to assess damage, assess soil type, assess damage uh, using a drone here. Uh, so we've got a few different things going on there. Um, every time I do this exercise, and it even worked here uh, via Zoom, someone ends up writing the word asses on the board. So that, that uh -huh. the same as always, just a typo on hey, it. Um, so uh, pretty normal responses from what we see with this exercise. We're supposed to use the drone in 1984. Be the format. Uh, 1989. Yeah, that, that's a good point. Uh, they probably wouldn't have drones. You might have had to use a balloon. I don't know what Cole Havey was doing at the time, but, uh, but yeah, the point, is, the point is you've got a lot of damage here. So you're definitely going to need to assess it and you don't know what per se has happened on your land yet. It's a million acres. That's huge. Um, when you start thinking about the challenges to assess it, a drone would have been a great tool if they'd had it back then. But again, these lessons apply to hurricanes today in our region. So nowadays, if you're working with one of these companies, I think drones would probably be a pretty critical tool because that's going to let you get a lot uh, more coverage of your stands in a much quicker time. Honestly, Low, the big issue you're going to run into is you may not even be able to get out close enough to these stands to use a drone. Uh, you're going to have a lot of trees downed on the roads. Uh, you're going to have major roads that are down. Yeah, Greg, I see you got a question. They had like the large military drones, but that was about it. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're not too worried about 1989 because these lessons are still applicable today. Yeah. Um, but uh, you're going to have trouble getting out to any of these stands via, you know, any of the roads. A lot of your woods roads may be so wet you can't drive on them. You just got 10 inches of rain. And so, honestly, uh, rather than drones, one thing companies may look at um, is getting fixed wing aircraft to fly areas so they can get imagery that way. There are companies that do that. Um, of course, you're going to be competing for those companies. The oil and gas line companies are probably going to be getting them to fly pipelines and uh, power line right-of-ways because there's going to be a lot of damage to a lot of different uh, industries. Uh, so there's a lot going on there all at once. But you need some picture of what's going on. Your challenge is how to get out there. You're going to be limited in terms of personnel. You only have so many people. They only have so many hours a day. Typically in these forestry companies, you've got people living in different areas. They may not be able to get into the main office. So lots of challenges in just in terms of figuring out what the heck is going on. That's going to take you a while. Um, I, I don't see that anyone had the chance to put it up here, but I heard from a couple of you in your groups saying, well, the mills are going to be saturated, right? Um, so all this timber just blown down, blew down. Everyone's trying to get it to the mill. And so I see this group 10 up here has put salvage viable timber for pulpwood to generate money. You definitely want to salvage everything that you can, uh, but the mills are going to fill up with timber pretty quickly. Prices are going to drop. They may stop taking timber. Here's the other thing that's going to go on. It's more complicated than that. The sawmills may really have a high demand for wood because a bunch of houses were just damaged. So there's increased demand for structural timber, but at the same time, the supply of saw timber just went down because a bunch of saw timber just got converted to pulpwood. So you may have a uh, scarcity uh, at saw timber mills and prices going up, but the pulp market probably crashes because now everything is pulpwood and everyone's trying to get it there. So getting your, your wood salvaged as quickly as possible is going to be key. Several of you wrote a salvage in there. Get what value you can. Um, this group here wrote hire a logging company that's gonna be a real challenge, right? Our logging companies are gonna be limited. We don't have that 
many of them. And now there's a lot of areas that need to be logged. So that's something you got to think about. Yeah, Hannah, I see you got your hand up. So with like coming in to salvage the fallen timber and just removing it and kind of getting it in order so you can pull it out of there. Will big private companies like that, do state agencies and federal agencies, do they come in to help? Because I know like around here, like if there's a tornado, like the U.S. Forest Service or TFS will come in to cut trees down that are in the way. But I didn't know how it worked with like big companies that own a lot of timber. Do they just like hire sawyer crews or? Yeah, they make sub subcontract with different companies. And keep in mind, if you're a big company, there's probably a dozen logging companies that you are already keeping in business year round. So you already have those established relationships. Now would be the time to leverage them where you work with those loggers and say, hey, keep working for me. We've got plenty more for you. Um, and so that may be an advantage to a big company. Um, now, in terms of the interactions of these companies and, and the federal and state agencies, um, if this had happened in Texas, you may have had 800,000 acres of national forests impacted, right? And so often what the private companies do, they're a lot more nimble than the federal government is. So they can get their stuff salvaged into the mill before the federal government has all the ribbons and bows of red tape tied onto their timber sales. And so once that volume gets out and into the mills, the market really crashes, but it takes them a while to do it. Uh, so that can be an advantage of these companies where they are able to do that a little bit more quickly. Um, in terms of how they interact and road clearing and all that stuff, I, I don't know how much of that would occur. Um, it, it's just going to depend on the nature. Keep in mind with a lot of these private companies, a lot of their forest roads are behind gates where they have the key. Um, so other agencies may not have that much access to them. So, um, okay. so those are all things you want to consider. Yeah. Um, and so, so you all have that. You have uh, prepare sites I'm seeing in a few places, establishment, plant seedlings, um, so you're looking at, at those sort of treatments, uh, artificial regeneration, a bunch of you have that in here. And so with regenerating your next stand, here's the issue. You probably weren't able to, able to salvage and clear everything that was damaged, so you can only look at regenerating some of it, okay? So what sites do you want to regenerate? Well, you need two things for the sites you want to regenerate. You need to be able to get to them, so you need access. And if you had your choice, you would try to plant your highest productivity sites. So you would use your GIS system now big time where you would create some sort of different map overlays where you had, these are the stands we can get to, here's an index of productivity, this is where we're gonna go and regenerate them to get the most bang for our buck. But to regenerate them, this happened in September, so you're rolling into the next planting season you probably aren't going to get that many seedlings to put into the ground. So uh, this happened in uh, the late 80s. In the late 1980s, we were producing about 1.6 billion pine seedlings a year. We're a little bit down from that now, okay? Um, and so we're down from that to maybe a billion a year. But here's the deal. Those seedlings were sown, the seed was sown into the nurseries in April, before this hurricane you know, anyone had a clue this was going to happen. So they were sown into the, the nursery beds in April. The number of seedlings you can get for this winter is fixed. Many of those seedlings are probably already under contract, okay? But you don't have access to that full 1.6 billion seedlings anyway, because out here in East Texas in 1989, we would have been growing, you know, tens of millions of seedlings. And those tens of millions in seedlings were bred to be planted in East Texas you can't really move them to the Carolinas because they're not adapted to the Carolinas. And so those seedlings aren't in the market for you. Um, you probably already had acreage you were planning to regenerate. You had already put in your seedling order. So there's not this sudden pulse of available seedlings. So when you're looking at the winter of 1989, 1990, you probably aren't gonna be regenerating a whole lot, okay? You're gonna be regenerating the stands you had already clear cut before July 1. And so those stands, you already had clear cut them. If you can get access to them, that's what you probably focus on planting, what you were already going to plant anyway. What you really need to be gearing up for is the following planting season, 16 months out from this event. So planting it in that next winter, because the nurseries now know this hurricane has hit. They can sow as many seeds as they can pack into their nurseries that year. You can get in orders for seedlings. And so there's going to be a time lag there. 
But even then, you know, the nurseries have fixed capacity. They only have so many acres, so they can only produce so many seedlings. So you're going to have to start thinking about natural regeneration. At least one of the groups here got that. What areas can you naturally regenerate? You're going to have a hard time finding crews to plant. You're going to have a hard time finding logging crews, maybe. So, uh, you know, your human capital uh, is going to be a challenge, too. So you've got economic constraints. You've got access constraints. You've got ecological constraints. Uh, one group in here I saw put mulching. And that's not a bad idea. You've got a lot of woody debris. Mulching is good for small acreages, though. On large acreages like this, mulching is going to be, it's just, it's too time consuming. It's too expensive. You're not going to be able to mulch that much, but you need to do something. Um, so let me stop sharing on this screen and let me pull up the original slideshow for you uh, and get it set up. And let me show you what they actually did. And that was one advantage of using an older hurricane is that they, they've done more work after it to know what happened. Um, and so here, uh, let's see here, get the participant window and everything up for us. Okay. Um, and so what you're seeing here um, is, uh, let's see, I've got other stuff in the way. Okay. Here's what they actually did. So they salvaged, just like you all proposed, and this skipped the assessment step, but that's obviously a necessary step. They managed to pull out over a third of their volume, which is pretty impressive, but only, they only got 10% of the value. Uh, so that they got very little value here, um, and that was the best that they could do. Um, they tried to get the higher value salvage, but unfortunately that was probably the hardwood areas. Those were inaccessible swamps. So they couldn't even get to the highest value stuff that they had out there available. Um, they, the other thing they realized that was going to happen is they're setting themselves up for major wildfire issues. Okay. And so that was going to be a big concern. And so with the wildfires that were going to be coming through, they knew they had a fuel issue. So prescribe burn what you can burn, um, you know, do what you can there, but fire is going to be a big issue. Mitigate that wherever you can you know burn's gonna go through there, put the burn through at a better time where it's not gonna be as damaging to the rest of the stand. And then reforest with that combination of planting and natural regeneration. So what you all came up with, you know, you guys pretty much came up with all these pieces here. Um, so that's what we're looking at. Now, here's some reestablishment guidelines for hurricanes that were derived from Hugo. Uh, these are pretty much identical to what Temple Inland used when some of the hurricanes hit here in the 2000s. So. Uh, basically, it's a way to prioritize stands because you know you can't do everything. I have a picture for you here. This is ice damage up in Oklahoma. This wasn't a hurricane, but you see a couple small bent over trees here from ice damage. In that case, the big trees were fine. But with a hurricane, basically what you see, if the pine is leaning more than 45 degrees, it's no good. You also have to think about if that tree continues to grow, uh, depending on whether it's a hardwood or a pine, is it going to put on compression wood and tension wood, then, then makes it impossible to mill boards out of it right? So the lean is a problem. And so if it's leaning more than 45 degrees, you really need to salvage that and regenerate it. Now, if the pines are older than seven and they're leaning more than 25 degrees, you probably need to regenerate that uh, because of that compression wood issue. If they're less than seven, they may spring back up. They may still be resilient, okay? Um, no immediate action is needed if you have sort of the opposite of that condition because those trees have the chance to recover. So it, you can almost think of this as triage, where you're doing the best job you can. It's not going to be a good job, but it's going to be the best job that you really can do. So, so that's what they did in response. And you can see you guys didn't get quite this detail, but you came up with the guidelines uh, to at least uh, get all this started. So, so that's how you might apply um, this integration of disturbances uh, and silviculture. So that's all we've got for this morning.